Thank you, everyone, for waiting on us to start today. It's my fault I'm late. I was running some bills over in budget sub, and, and both of them went behind the budget, so everybody can sleep easy. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you'd uh, take the roll. Representative Speck, Bricken, Bolso, Capley, Eldridge, Gant, Here. Garrett, Grills, Harris, Lamberth, Littleton, Parkinson, Powell, Russell, Stevens, Todd, Vice Chairman Jernigan, Chairman Farmer, Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. And, and thank you for that. Uh, folks, we have, I'm just going to go through the calendar here. Got a couple of announcements uh, out of the gate. Item 5, House Bill 731 by Representative Fritz is off notice. That's House Bill 731, off notice. Moving down to item 12, House Bill 1044, Representative Bricken. Uh, waiting on an amendment there. We're going to have it. It's going to be good next week, so we're going to roll it for one week without objection. Very good. House Bill 1044, roll for one week. And... That'll bring us to the top of our calendar. That's item one, House Bill 905 by uh, Speaker Johnson. And we, and I do apologize, Speaker, just give one second. Representative Grills, you're recognizing members. Anyone else who has any comments or recognitions before we start, after we start? Okay. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also, uh, I want to welcome uh, Benjamin Gillette. Uh, he's, uh, Got three older brothers, a younger sister. He's in the sixth grade, 12 years old. He's up here job shadowing me today from the uh, Eagle Forum. Seemed like a really nice young man, so y'all make him feel welcome and get a chance to talk to him and ask him a few questions. And also, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have my uh, oldest daughter, Hadley. She's uh, in sixth grade. She plays on the sixth, seventh, and eighth uh, grade volleyball team for CCA. Last night, they had their awards banquet, and uh, she got the MVP of the team as a sixth grader. So I was extremely uh, surprised, satisfied, and humble. So extremely proud of her. Thank she, you, Mr. Chairman. She must get that from her mother. Well, her mama's not very tall. She, I will say she gets her looks from her mama. <laughs> very good. Charlie Lilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also have a shadow today, Avery Fitzhugh. She is from Stewart County, and it's so good these kids come up here and get to learn how uh, law and policy really work. So let's give her a big round of applause. Very good. Members, anyone else? All right. Well, thank President you, Mr. Johnson, Chairman. You're recognized. And Looks like we got an uh, amendment 6357. That's something you want to move forward That's true. But, Mr. Chairman, Yes, sir. I know I'm out, out of order, but I have a guest with me, uh, Garrett Maria, who is a senior from Stewart County High School. Uh, he'll be going to Cumberland University on a golf scholarship. So welcome. Well, congratulations, young man. Very good. Yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I do have an amendment uh, 6357. Very good. Members, you want to go ahead and get that on? We've got a motion, got a second. All those in favor of the House adopting House Amendment 6357, House Bill 905, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I was happy. Now we're back on the bill as amended. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 905, as amended, seeks to add new judges where they are needed most. Uh, District 13, which is Clay County, Cumberland, DeKalb, Overton, Pickett, Putnam, and White counties. Uh, originally, it said one circuit court. Uh, but the amendment changes that to criminal court. Very good. Any any questions? Question has been called. Any objection to the question? Any objection to the question? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote. Send House Bill 905 as amended to finance. All of the favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Bill moves on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee. Thank, thank you, sir. Item two, uh, Chairman Williams. You got a motion. That's House Bill 1202. And I'm looking at about three amendments right here. I'm going to wait till you get up here, sir, and then you can let me know thank, what, what we thank want to you. do. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Chairman. The drafting code of uh, the amendment is, uh, is different than the subcommittee amendment. It's drafting code 6139. Okay. Was, okay. Looks like uh, we've got a motion and a second. We'll go ahead and adopt that amendment. A vote to adopt it. Any objection? Okay. Uh, we're going to vote to adopt House Amendment 6139 to House Bill uh, 1202. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those say no. Now we're on the bill as amended. And I've got, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got three folks okay. that had given the office notice to testify. Do you want to go ahead and, and present your bill, take questions with the committee, or you want to let these folks testify and then come back? I'm, 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 I'm at the... 
Remember, what y'all want to do? You want to go out, go out of session? Go ahead and take this testimony. Want to do that? All right, fair enough. All right, that objection. We're going out of session. Uh, Leanne uh, Hewlett. Leanne, are you here? And then I've got uh, Jennifer Larson. Jennifer, are you here? Okay, come on up here. And I've got uh, Linda McFadden. Catch him. Uh, Linda, are you here as well? Yeah. Ladies, if y'all just go up there and just have, we've got six seats up there. Just pick, pick three of the six, sit down, and, and I'll give you all, we will give you all three minutes apiece to present your testimony, and then we'll take questions uh, afterwards, if that's okay. Chairman Williams looks like he's, just be sure your red light's on. Either one of y'all, Linda, once you, Linda, once you go, just, you go first, and we'll work our way down that way. Just, it's each of you, uh, just identify yourself, sure. the committee, who you're with, and, and get three minutes apiece, okay? Yeah. All right, that sounds good. Hi, I'm Linda McFadgen Ketchum here today representing Moms Demand Action Tennessee. We are a gun violence prevention and gun safety organization. I taught in Tennessee public schools for over 30 years. I and Moms Demand Action oppose arming teachers. I spent thousands of years, sorry, felt like years, thousands of hours. <laughs> I spent thousands of hours in buildings full of children and young people during my 30-year career as a Tennessee public school teacher. I know teachers and I know children. Teachers become teachers because we want to help kids learn new skills and grow and develop, make new friends. We want to nurture children and help them live healthy, productive lives and grow into helpful citizens. It's totally outside our skill set and worldview to even think about shooting someone at school. So why would you even think of loading school security onto teachers, the last people in the world who would be good at it? I think it's because of money, as most things usually seem to come down to. You say your county or school system is too poor to afford a school resource officer or other school security professional. I say, please try harder to find this money that you need. Our state government is full of smart, creative people who could find this money. Tell your fellow legislators that you need their help funding school security. Tell the governor you need the money. He's going to come after educational funding in schools that don't keep their doors locked. Let's turn that around and tell him you need an SRO in your school to ensure the doors are locked at all times to keep intruders out. What about the rainy day fund? It seems to be bursting at the seams. Please don't lay school security concerns at the feet of teachers. People who want to take care of sick people choose medical professions. People who want to get good at growing food decide to be farmers. People who want to defend our nation choose the military. We teachers want to grow and nurture children, and that's all. Find another way. Please vote against this bill. Perfect. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, my name is Jennifer Larson. I am the mother of two students here in Metro Nashville Public Schools. And I want to tell you that one thing I've learned as the mother of two teenage boys is that accidents happen. My older son was at a traffic light on West End near our church, and another driver rear-ended him. My younger son chipped his front tooth when his Boy Scout troop was undoing their Christmas trees to their Christmas tree lot. And a few years ago, I tripped and fell over the dishwasher door and broke my leg. Accidents happen. In fact, in 2021, 549 people lost their lives as a result of an accidental gun death. 549, that's more than the number of kids in my son's class at school. Accidents happen. You may have heard about the case in Texas recently where a third grader went into the bathroom at his um, elementary school in the Rising Star Independent School District and found the superintendent's gun that had been left in there. There was a case in Florida a couple of years ago where a substitute teacher had a loaded gun in the waistband of his pants and it fell out on the playground with lots of elementary school children running around. Accidents happen. And if we allow and encourage our educators to carry firearms in the classroom, we're opening up the door for many more potential accidents to happen. 
We haven't even talked about something that one of my sons expressed concern about, and that is what if a child tries to get a hold of a firearm when they find out their teacher has one as a joke? It would be a joke with a punchline with potentially deadly consequences. And the research doesn't show a benefit that would outweigh this risk. According to a 2019 study in the Texas Education Review out of the University of Texas at Austin, quote, research shows that regularly trained law enforcement officers' accuracy rate in active shooter situations ranges from 18% to 43%. The low accuracy rates are most often attributed to a high stress in elements of these encounters, end quote. Our teachers are not regularly trained law enforcement officers. They're educators. They're trained, thank goodness, to teach things like English and algebra and calculus and history and music. We're grateful for that, but they already have so many responsibilities on them, I can't imagine asking them to take this on. Not only that, they don't really want this responsibility. A Gallup poll in 2018 found that 73% of educators don't want to do this. So I want to ask you, as my representatives, as William and Andrew, my son's representatives, let's not do this, Bill. Let's not open up the possibility of these accidents that can happen. We know enough accidents already do happen. We don't need any more. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. That was three minutes exactly. I think you, did you time yourself on that? <laughs> That's a good job. Um, <laughs> uh, next is Ms. Hewlett, I guess. You have three minutes. Uh, is this on? Okay. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Leanne Hewlett. I'm the parent of an elementary public school student here in Tennessee, and I'm asking you to vote against House Bill 1202, arming K through 12 public school students. Under this bill, the requirement for school teachers and staff to carry a loaded gun in the sometimes chaotic environment of a school would be a carry permit, permit 40 hours of training a year, and approval from law enforcement. I cannot imagine that this is enough to manage a classroom of 20 or more students, educate them, and make sure the firearm is safely secured so an accidental shooting does not occur. Just last month in Texas, Rising Star Independent School District Superintendent Rodby Studerfeld left his firearm in the school bathroom accessible to students. A third grade student found that gun. Thankfully, that student reported it to his teacher but it would have just been, it would be equally as easy for him to pick it up and accidentally harm himself or another person. Guns in our schools is a recipe for a deadly mistake. Under this bill, the record of who's carrying on campus would be sealed from parents and principals. In an active suitor situation, how will responding law enforcement be notified of who is authorized to carry? How will they tell the good guys from the bad? When we have armed law enforcement on campus, it's easy to identify them based on their uniforms and they can communicate with other responding officers. Teachers cannot. This, I believe, will cause unnecessary confusion and could delay response to an active shooter situation from law enforcement. This legislature has made a point to honor parents' rights in school, but this legislation will be kept in the dark about the presence of guns around our children. I ask you to continue to give parents rights to know what's going on in our schools, the right to know what our children are exposed to, and not allow school staff to carry while we parents are kept in the dark. I'd also like to point out that this bill expects teachers or school staff in the event of a school shooting to put themselves in the line of fire and possibly shoot a coworker, parent, or student. I think we put enough responsibility on our teachers. They don't need this. Additionally, it puts an unbelievable liability burden on the teacher to be sued if they accidentally shoot a student. I'd like to also ask this committee why we can't fund law enforcement officers or SROs for our schools. If student safety is the priority, why aren't we putting our tax money to work to let thoroughly trained law enforcement officers protect our schools and our kids? Why are we relying on teachers who are sometimes already overworked whose only training is in education, not law enforcement, to protect our kids and themselves in these dangerous situations. I ask you again to please vote no against, or vote against Senate Bill, or House Bill 1202. Thank you. Well, that's right at three minutes, that's perfect. All right, <laughs> members, do we have any, any questions or comments for our guests? I have on the list, I have Representative Capley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I've got a school district, well, a school in my district right now that hasn't had a resource officer for eight weeks. They've had no resource officer at the school on the property for eight weeks. So what what am I as a legislator supposed to do when there's literally no police officer in any way, shape, or form at the school? Do you all have any suggestions as far as that goes? Go, go ahead. You're recognized. Uh, either whomever. Uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I would ask you as a representative why we aren't bringing forth bills to fund SROs in all of our schools then. Okay. All right. Here, here's here's oh, the deal. I apologize. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fine. And I, and I get it. I know where you come from. But just if you don't mind, we'll ask questions. And you're here to provide us with as much information as possible. Sure. So we're, we're, we're happy to ask as many questions of you. So if you just provide us with that information and if you want to speak with Representative, Representative Capley after the committee or something, mm -hmm. ask him some questions and you're you're more than welcome to do so. Can I rephrase the answer then? Sure. Uh, I, I guess um, I would say that your school district should find a way to support um, paying for an SRO or law enforcement. President Capley, can you follow up? So it's not about paying, it's the staffing issue. There, There's money there. We can't find anyone who wants to go and be a sheriff. It's a staffing issue. It's it's not a funding issue. There's money there. We literally cannot find bodies to go to work. Okay, you have you have any questions? I appreciate the statement, and I know they do. Maybe not, but any questions for our guests? All right, members. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Mr. Yes, Chairman Grills, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And maybe just to just to kind of go back to the bill. You, you made several statements there. You have to be in, the bill states that you have to be in, in consultation with the local law enforcement. There's 40 hours of training that these teachers would go through. It's not every teacher that's going to be there is going to have a weapon. They're going to be those who want to be able to handle those weapons and, and protect those kids. And I think that it's a fantastic idea, Chairman Williams, to bring this forward. But why would you be fearful of someone that had the training had, that had the training, worked in compliance with their LEA and the and the chief of police or the sheriff, why would you be objective to that? My response is that, as I cited the report from the Uni University of Texas, regularly trained on, who are professional law enforcement officers have a low accuracy rate when, when responding to active shooter situations. That's what they're trained to do. They, this is what they work in every day. A teacher may never have an opportunity to use their weapon. And we hope that that would be the case if that happened. But we can't rely on them to respond in the way, even as well as a law enforcement officer, because that's not what they're trained to do. Uh, okay. Chairman Grills. I'm, I'm good. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Members, anyone else before we excuse our speakers? All right. Thank you, ladies. Really appreciate you all being here, taking your time out of your day. Without objection, we'll go back in session. Back on House Bill 1202 as amended. Members, have any questions for our sponsor? President Beck, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sponsor, can you explain to us, since this is a this is not the same uh, amendment that we had in um, sub, can you explain to us your new amendment and what it does, please, sir? Chairman Williams, you're recognized. Yes, I'll, I'll be happy to tell you what the whole amendment does, but for the purposes of your question, I'll tell you what changed. Uh, between sub and full. Uh, in, in the, at the end of section two, uh, there's a paragraph added that this law would not apply to those Department of Children's Services facilities uh, or to the Department of Corrections facilities. In consultation with law enforcement and the departments, uh, there are schools that are operated by them, and these usually have... Um, juveniles that were charged with crimes or under care and those law enforcement agencies and Department of Correction and in Department of Children's Services did not want this to apply to them. Uh, they were happy with the rest of it, but they were just concerned about those. I think there's three facilities in the state. President Beck, any follow-up? <clears throat> uh, this, there, there's other changes. Yes. And that, those are the majority of the changes. The other changes were the um, 
the written authorization as it relates to privacy changed uh, a little bit in that, uh, and I forgot to say this, thank, thanks to the ladies for testifying. And uh, this is not my first attempt at this, but um, I was in uh, this uh, committee's several years ago and most of the ch uh, concerns or challenges that uh, were that were made then or po posed then have been included those in this bill and that has to do with the training uh, this bill <clears throat> is mirrored in 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 most cases uh, like our higher education campus carry law and that's the reason why their concerns were about the the information being made private because we didn't want someone uh, to know who these these people were that were willing to carry that were willing to do the training because the whole purpose of it being uh, concealed uh, is really important to them as it relates to the training the 40-hour training was in the bill previously or in the amend previous amendment and the reason for the training is that way the the law enforcement agency who has an mou with the lea is responsible not only for that certified 40 hours of training, but knowing who these people would be and where they would be located and how to fold their uh, willingness to serve in this fashion into their active shooter program for each school that each school has. And so um, that in a nutshell is what the bill does. I'm happy to answer any specific other questions that you might have. Um, Resident back, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, First question would be, what's your theory in not letting the principal know? Sure, please. Well, the the theory in, in not letting the principal know is because uh, the principal is responsible for hiring and firing, much like a dean in, on a higher education campus would be. And if a teacher went through the training in order to do that and the principal uh, didn't, uh, new, then they may use this as a reason to terminate a, a teacher, and that's not uh, the intent of of the of the language at all. And that was mirrored after what we did on higher education campuses. President Beck, the director uh, of schools though is aware, and so is the the law enforcement agency. But the directors of schools are usually far removed from the campus that the school is is on. It seems to me. Number one, that you would want the the captain of ship, the principal, to to know who has uh, who is armed in case there is an emergency that arises. Um, second, I notice that we still have in the bill uh, the immunity uh, to the LEA from any claims from damages of of these handguns that our staff, our faculty and staff members are are uh, toting around, in my reading, that would be any negligence or any uh, damages that they cause uh, while they have uh, these guns with them, whether it's uh, uh, shooting a, another uh, teacher, uh, student, anyone, anyone else, I, I, you know, this is this is a a, a huge uh, departure from respondent superior, where the uh, uh, employ the employer is always liable for the employee. So, what is your theory in in granting this immunity on on this uh, subset of em employees, Chairman? Uh in consultation with local law enforcement, they felt like, in, uh, or not local law enforcement, my sheriff and the sheriff's association, they felt like this was a uh, applicable way to do it, and that was the suggestion that they made. Back. So law enforcement wanted you to give immunity um, to the teachers or faculty or staff that are a handgun carrying uh, in our schools from any negligence or any uh, action that they have to, that they carry out with that gun. No, that's not what I've said. It, in the, the bill in, on page four of the amendment of paragraph H, it says it's, it's only the LEA, not. 
Here's an answer your question. Right, but that that's respondent superior. There were the LEAs not responsible for the actions right. of the employee. So that your I get my 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 question is why are we departing from that? Chairman. I don't I don't have an answer to your question. I I I the way it reads to me is that the immunity claim based upon the way I read it is for the LEA uh, on monetary damages as it, as it reads um, the LEA can't be sued, but the individual still could be sued. Beck. But they're not becoming teachers for the money. They're not there. The LEA is, is, is who is uh, responsible for their employees. Thank you very much. Right, Mr. Any, any follow up? Mm. Okay, fair enough. Uh, next on the list, I have uh, Chairman Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to clarify, this is concealed, and uh, there's nothing in the bill that says a teacher has to carry a gun. Is that correct? That that is correct, Chairman. The, um, in when you look at what happened with higher education campuses across across the state, you know there were uh, over 40,000 faculty and staff members and approximately 3% of those now take advantage of, of that law. My suspicion is there would be fewer in this case, but in, in the bill, it has to be concealed. Jim Russell. I just want to say thank you for bringing this legislation forward. I think it makes sense. You know, we've got a short follow officers across the state of Tennessee especially school resource officers. And since 2018, since I've been here, we've given over $500 million to schools for school safety, and that includes school resource officers, um, equipment, and mental health monies for K-12 through students. And I can't imagine uh, letting the principals know simply because if you got a teacher with a concealed uh, weapon, you would want this element of surprise. And if mm -hmm. the principal knows, I should have said the principal know. Uh, that'll leave the surprise for anybody an intruder to a school. So I want to say thank you for that. And as far as responding agencies, I would imagine the chief of the local law enforcement would notify the dispatch center of who's carried a weapon at that facility so they would know. So thank you. Very good. Any follow-up, sir? No, sir. I, I would say that, you know, one of the things as related to the study from the study committee after the Parkland shooting, this is one of the uh, recommendations that they had that they felt like could improve overall school safety in Florida based upon that shooting. And I think one of the biggest benefits for um, our communities, whether they're like Representative Kaplings where they have a problem, uh, Kaplings where they're having a problem finding school resource officers or whether mine where you have, uh, my largest high school has 2,700 students and more than 300 doors and only one school resource officer uh, it, they're very, it, it's a very challenging place to police, but I will say that that one thing that we're able to do is to have a sign on every school in Tennessee that says there may be someone in this facility carrying a handgun, uh, concealed other than the school resource officer. And I think there's a great value to that and the deterrency of it. Uh, and, and that was proven out when we passed K, uh, higher education campus carry because overall crime, according to the TBI crime report on higher, higher education campuses, went down more than 20% in every category. And so I think what this does is it gives a, a pathway, a responsible pathway to where uh, a school teacher, if they so choose to volunteer, has an opportunity to protect its students instead of uh, running headlong into, into harm's way armed with nothing. And thank you for that. Uh, Chairman Russell, any follow-up? No, thanks. He answered everything. Thanks. Very good. Next to us, I have uh, Representative Capley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, thank you for bringing this piece of legislation. I'd like to echo the comments of the gentleman who spoke before me. I think it's fantastic. Uh, just so it'll be on record as I'm reading through this, that we're not just doing a blind shuffle of a handgun in a school. There is going to be a law enforcement agency that will know the contact information and all that sort of stuff, correct? Chairman Williams. Yes, sir. And, and in consultation with my law enforcement agency, there will be a, a protocol for someone after they do this training so that they can clearly identify themselves and how the lo 
local law enforcement agency that responds will be able to communicate where their presence is and how, and where they are at, at all times. Any thought? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Uh, next on the list and last, I have Representative or Vice Chair Jernigan. Um, thank you. And, and uh, Chairman, I just have two quick questions. One is, uh, so they they have access to carry on the school grounds where they're at, correct? So if they were to transfer to another school, would they have to, I assume they'd have to go through the recredentialing process? Sure, I, you recognize. Thank you. I, it's my understanding based upon the bill that it's, if they would have to have uh, the training for that um, LEAs, whoever the law enforcement agency is for that LEA, once they do that training, if they move inside the LEA from one campus to another they wouldn't have to if they went outside that uh uh as long for instance if you if you were uh moved from one to another and you changed uh, law enforcement agencies who are responsible for that then yes they would have to go and get recertified that's your turn so i guess in the process if they move to a, another school within the system I mean, the, the law enforcement agency certainly needs to know that, correct? Chairman? Yes, sir, they would. Okay, all right. Uh, my second one is there are a list here of what a faculty and staff member assigned shall not do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went through the list, and it's A through E. Yes, sir. But, um, what are the consequences if someone breaks that? I couldn't find that in the law, if they violate those. Chairman Williams. There, there is no violation of the – hold on, I'm just reading to make sure. The, uh, there is no violation or criminal penalty if they don't follow A through E. So it's Chairman, can I go out and session and ask a legal question? Yeah, I'd be fine. It's it's currently in the code to revert back to what's on on um but yes, members, any objection going out of session? All right, Ms. Fogarty, you recognize. Okay. Michelle Fogarty Legal Services under 3911 111 when the performance or non performance of an act is made criminal by statute and no penalty punishment or forfeiture for the violation is imposed then it's considered then it is it's an it's a misdemeanor and if the level of misdemeanor is not specified then it's an a misdemeanor is Bus here. is there anything for a repeat offender does, yeah. it, does it enhance or there's nothing that provides for that in the okay in the amendment very good. Any, any other questions for legal while we're out of session? Anyone? All right. The objection. We're back in Thank session. You. And I'll just have one more follow up. Go ahead. So would the would the LEA have the authority to remove that person from having a weapon if this is violated even more than once? I mean, if it's a misdemeanor. Could they fire someone for having a misdemeanor on the record, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Chairman Williams. The Denver schools could do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very good. All right. I have uh, Representative Powell. Did you want to be recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so just so I'm clear, if, if a school has school resource officers that are present, um, and I realize you gave an example of a large school, but, you know, let's say there is a sufficiently uh, staffed SRO, we're still allowing – for these concealed handgun, these concealed guns in the school. Is that correct? Chairman Williams. If they meet the criteria spelled out in the amendment, yes. Okay. So uh, I guess my concern here is, I've got a lot of concerns, but, you know, I know it was referenced a lot of times, this example of insufficient SROs, which um, I think, you know, we need something we really need to take a look at and address, but still, um, 
this this still gives me a lot of pause, even in those examples when we have sufficient SROs in place, we're still allowing for this. And I guess, and I don't think this is on you, but just th there have been a, some comments here about principles and concern about principles. And I just want to be on record as saying, I think the principles uh, in our school systems across the state do a very admirable job. And I hate to say that there's some sort of climate of mistrust that exists amongst the principals in our schools, um, that they would terminate someone just because, you know, they might have a, a gun. But um, so I want to put that out there. My, my other question is, when it comes to if someone was a in, in, in our school system uh, here in Davidson County, you know, we have a problem with staffing of teachers if there is a substitute teacher in place, that person might not be used to that environment. They might not be in that school every day. Would they still be allowed to carry? Sure, please. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate between a substitute teacher and a, what would be a permanent teacher. However, the substitute teacher would still have to go through the training background check, have an in, in enhanced carry permit, just like, the other person would and you would also have to get approval from the local law enforcement agency and the director of schools and my i can't imagine that being the case and it does it does reference uh, looking at the section it says uh includes all faculty staff and other persons who are employed on a full-time basis by the lea just reading the language of the bill so, so substitutes would not be allowed. Is that correct? Sure. Well, I guess it would determine whether or not a substitute teacher is considered a full-time employee or not. For instance, if a substitute teacher, and I don't know what the answer to that is for every LEA as it relates to a full-time status. It, it looks like it reads, uh, includes all faculty, staff, and other persons who are employed on a full-time basis so it looks like it probably would uh what? substitutes may be included in faculty and staff there that's what it yes chairman that's what it does say but it doesn't i i just don't know the answer to the full-time or not full-time but it does say they have to be full-time employees okay all right, pal. um two other questions one is is there anything in here for parents they might have concerns about their child being, you know, they were made aware of one way or another of, of uh, one of their, their children being in a classroom where, say, the teacher was carrying. Is there anything to allow the parents to pull their kids out of those school, that class specifically or make that request? Chairman Lloyds. No, there, there's not a provision in the statute for that. Isabel. Okay, and I, I guess my, my last question here is um, going back to the, the um, just the overall premise of this. I mean, it gives me, and I'll say this a, more of a comment, but, you know, I just, I have a lot of concerns about this bill. I appreciate the testimony that was given, um, but. Yeah, I, I think that they're and, and and I had reservations about, you know, when this was done a higher education setting. Um, and I think that this uh, is even more concerning uh, being in our um, schools. I am a um, massive proponent of doing everything we can to protect our schools. Uh, you and I probably philosophically disagree on how we do that. But um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue to not use um, legislation like this, and we'll continue to adequately fund school resource officers, make that recruitment of them available, and not use this as a means to substitute those funds. So I just want to you know, hope whether or not this passes, you know, we can all agree that we're going to continue to work on those efforts and not just say, this is something we're doing, and now, you know, we have the proper measures in place. We need to continue to spend those funds and, and make that a, a, an effort, I think, as a state. Thank you. Very good. And that's uh, any follow up there? No, I just I, I agree with agree with you wholeheartedly. There's not a there's not no one panacea as it relates to how this can be fixed. But I, I do think we need to continue to spend monies hardening our schools mm -hmm. and supporting our SROs as well. OK, I don't have anyone else on the list. Are we ready to vote. Any objection? Questions have been called. 
Seeing no objection, looks like we're ready to vote to send House Bill 1202 to it's going to be double referred to Education and Administration, full committee there. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I just have it. Aye. Bill moves on. Thank you, Chairman and members. Thank you. Item three, we're going to hold right there, and I'm going to recognize uh, Representative Bricken, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I would like our committee to welcome the group of adult and youth leadership from Grundy County. If they would stand up, and the mayor of Grundy County, Michael Brady. So if everybody from Grundy County would stand up and be welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. And, and members, I have a I have a young lady that's just shadowing uh, me and, and Robbie today. Uh, Mallory Wallace, she's sitting right back there. If you just make her welcome, member, she's right behind us. As a matter of fact, she's behind us back there, sitting at Clark's desk. Appreciate that. She's taking an interest in what we're doing, so she's probably taking notes. So we better behave. And then and now we have uh, uh, item three. I don't see I don't see Chairman Crawford. So members, if we don't mind, let's go ahead and roll that a couple. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, Leader Lambert. Mr. Chairman, we're, as usual, the class of 2012, we th think along the same lines. Chairman Crawford had asked me to ask him to be rolled four spaces, and Mr. Chairman, I think that's what you're about to do, so uh, that it was his request. That's right. I was going to say, members, without objection, can we roll this four spaces <laughs> without objection? Done. Thank, thank you, Leader Lambert. Uh, that brings to item four. I see Representative Travis sitting there and standing there now. House Bill 619. You got a motion and a second, and it looks like you've got an amendment to uh, Four, five, seven, four. Yes, Mr. Move Chairman. Forward with that. Members, we want to go ahead and get that on. You got a motion, got a second. Any objection to vote on that? Seeing none, looks like we're going to vote to adopt House Amendment 4241 to, excuse me, 4574 to House Bill 619. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. I just have it. Now we're back on the bill as amended and you recognize, sir. Thank you, sir. And the amendment does make the bill, um, Chairman. Uh, the DCS commissioner shall notify the committee the committing court at least 15 days prior to the proposed discharge of a child it takes effect if passed July 1st, 2023. Very good. Members, any questions, comments for Representative Travis before, before we vote? Questions have been called. Any objections? Seeing none. Looks like we're ready to vote. Send House Bill 619 as amended to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Bill moves on. That brings us to item six, House Bill 820 by Representative Chisholm. Sir, you are recognized, and I don't I don't see any amendments on this bill. You got a motion and a second, you're probably recognized. Thank you, Chair and Committee. Uh House Bill 820, 820, uh, it allows uh the overpayment of child support to be applied to future payments until that overpayment is exhausted. And with that, I stand by for questions. Interesting. Richard Parkinson, you recognize me. What a great bill. Thank you for that. And I want to sign on. Thank you. Members, any questions for Representative Chisholm? I have uh, Leader Lambert, or excuse me, Chair Leader Littleton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What about arrears? If they have arrears, would that go towards those? Representative Chisholm. Yeah, if, if they're behind it, that overpayment would go towards it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Leader, do you have any questions? Thank you, Chairman. Um, what would the process on this look like? Representative Chisholm, you recognize? Uh, it, it would go like the like the overpayment of a light bill, for example. Uh, if if your if your light bill is three hundred dollars, you pay three sixty. That sixty dollars go towards the next month. Leader, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, but I mean, as far as from a process standpoint, I mean, is this something that someone's going to have to go to the court and? I mean, a lot of folks obviously that are paying child support i mean that that's but two it's between two adult individuals and if someone overpaid is, do they need to file a motion with the court is the process that they're going to go through a governmental agency i mean it how is this going to be worked out well since uh, all child support funds are paid to private pump uh, private parties there would be no uh fiscal impact but also uh it would we will not alter or remove the predetermined court ordered amount given, or nor would it change the process. There, Lambert. I understand that, but I mean, again, what process would be utilized? So, if someone owes a thousand dollars, okay, a month, and one month they send two checks. I guess is what the the situation you're envisioning here. 
they tell the person, hey, I've overpaid a month. I'm not going to pay the next month. And, and there's some disagreement between the parties. I mean, is this something that there's a process in here for them to go to court? I mean, because by the time they go to court, we're months down the road. I'm just trying to figure out how this would work. Where's the chism? Uh, I'm 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 familiar to the situation that you that you you're bringing up. Um, um, so what what this bill does it it just merely if there's an overpayment of child support, uh, it will go towards the next the, the next month's child support. Uh, if if that person is behind, that child support will go towards their uh, delinquent payment. But if uh, they're they're on time on their child support payments. It would just uh, go towards the next month until uh, that over overpayment is uh, exhausted. Later. Fair enough. Uh, Representative Garrett, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's Representative Chiz. I think this is a good idea uh, in, a, in a certain extent, but I, I do believe it's been general subbed in the Senate, so it's not going to be moving over there. But my my question for you, there is what the state has, it's called a child support receiving unit where people pay the state and the state pays the child support to the obligee at that point or obligor. <clears throat> and it may be worth when this, if this bill is revived to make it apply to that because it could create an issue between the parents if they're paying each other, whether or not that was truly an overpayment or should it be applied towards arrears as was said before. So I could see there could be an issue on how the credit is going to apply. But if this would apply to the child support receiving unit, which keeps up with these payments and arrearages, et cetera, there may be a way that the state could apply that credit or overpayment to future payments. But I think this has got potentially some practical issues to how the overpayments would be applied. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that since this is apparently not gonna be moving in the uh, other chamber um, to maybe work through how that overpayment could be could be applied to the child support order. So I just offer that information for you. Yeah, President Chisholm, and I'm thinking that uh, we're gonna have another meeting, right? Sounds like there's quite a few questions from the committee members. We'll have another week. How would you feel about rolling this one week, answering the questions of the committee members and see if you can work with your Senate sponsor to pull that out of general sub? If not, then I hate to waste, I hate to spend any more time, not waste, but I hate to spend any more committee time on this if we're, if it's not going to move in the, in the, in the Senate. Um, and then give you also to give you time to answer questions for Leader Lambert, Kristen Garrett, and I have a few questions myself uh, about this bill. What, what do you think? Oh, I, I'd be happy to work with everyone. Okay. Members, want to, want to roll this for one, the next week's calendar. All those favors say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I'll have it. Rolled one week. Brings us to item seven, House Bill 1225 by Leader Lambert. Got a motion and second, and I'm looking at a couple of amendments, uh, Mr. Leader. Uh, which one would you like to move forward with? I got 5312 and 5826. 5826, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Members? Got a motion, got a second. We'll go ahead and vote to put that on. Looks like we do. All those in favor adopting House Amendment uh, 5826 to House Bill 1225, say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, say no. I just have it. Now we're back on the bill as amended. Leader, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What this allows um, the court to do is to give a restricted driver's license to someone that is behind on child support payments. Right now, that takes kind of a, a roundabout way for them to be able to get a restricted license. Uh, they have, the license has to be revoked, and then it has to go through the department, then they have to get on a payment plan, then it kind of comes back. And instead, if we'll just give the judges the discretion to do that in court, um, then it allow them to get a allow someone to get a restricted driver's license quicker and continue to work, go to school, whatever it is. And normally it's very limited, but this gives the judge the discretion on that. Very good. Great explanation. Members, we have any questions for our leader? Representative Parkinson, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to tell the leader, thank you for bringing this bill. It's a good bill. And I, I want to sign on if I can. If it won't sink your bill, I'm sure it won't, though. I mean, Mr. Chairman, I guess we'll find out in a minute on how the committee feels after that comment, but I hope it would not affect the bill negatively. Hopefully it would be positive. But. No. Question's been called. Any objection? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote. Send House Bill 1225 as amended to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Unanimous. Hey, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. And that brings us to back to item three uh, by Chairman Crawford, House Bill 1374. We had previously rolled him four spots. I don't see him, Leader Lambert. Chairman, sure, make a motion to roll that to the heel of today's calendar, please. Very good. Any objection, members? 
1374 uh, by Chairman Crawford. Bring roll to the hill. Any of you say none? All in favor say aye. Aye. To the hill. Very good. And that brings us to item eight by Chairman Todd. And I'm, you want to roll that, sir? Yes, if we could, I'd like to roll this one week. Very good. Members, any objection for rolling House Bill uh, 563 by Chairman Todd one week? Seeing none. Roll the week. That brings us to item nine. We have uh, House Bill 312 by Chair Lady Littleton. You got a motion second. I don't see any amendments, ma'am. Can you believe that? That's good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, this bill, um, the bill helps modernize DCS adoption process in three different ways. First, the bill corrects the recent Court of Appeals decision misinterpreting when a court may find that the grounds of persistent conditions exist in order to terminate the parental rights. Second, the bill corrects the moder uh, and modernized practices related to the release and maintenance of adoption records due to the scandal over 70 years ago involved in children's society operator uh, manipulated adoption records. A provision has placed a was placed into law regarding storage of adoption records to require the certain records be maintained by the Secretary of State. So this legislation would remove the requirement for the Secretary of State to handle these records, thus ex uh, expediting the services of Tennessee uh, customers and reducing the unnecessary workload for the staff. Finally, the statute requires courts conducting adoption proceedings to send adoption records to DCS at various stages of the, of the adoption process. Very good. And thank you for that explanation. Members, do we have any questions for Chair Lady Little? Question has been called. Any objection? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote to send House Bill 312 to finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I just have it. That brings us to item 10, House Bill 551. Chair Lady, you're recognized. Motion. You got a motion and a second. I'm looking at two amendments, 5660 and 5825. 5825, please. I mean, 5852, please. Motion. Second. Is that 5825? Is that what you have? What? Um, 5825. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you've motion. got a motion and a second on that amendment. We're going to go ahead and get that amendment on the bill. Members, any objection to that? Seeing none. All in favor of adopting House Amendment 5825 to House Bill 551, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I just have it. You recognize, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I worked with Senator Hale and numerous other members of all different walks of life for this we call it this the uh, adoption anonymous bill so it has several different little things to it and i'm just going to read some captions off of that uh, ad adjusting allowable expenses that can be paid for the potential adoptive parent requiring courts to enter surrender order when all other conditions have been met reducing surrender revocation periods when appropriate adding rape offenses to the list of the grounds of termination of parental rights, requiring DCS to file a petition for termination of parental rights within a set period of time when the case involves heinous circumstances, strengthens standards for punitive and biological fathers wishing to hold themselves out as the father of the child, prohibits ad adoptions from being overturned after a shorter period of time than currently in law, making it harder for the parties to show up after everything has been settled, prioritizes the search of kinship placements and giving foster care parents and other involved parties availability to be more involved in court proceedings and requiring DCS to accept outside home studies under certain circumstances. All this was done with the goal of making adoption a, a being, um, a being foster parents faster, cheaper, and easier in Tennessee. Very good, and thank you for that explanation. Members, have any questions for Chair Lady? Representative Bolso. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, my question is uh, more properly directed to legal counsel. So, if we could go out of session, we we'll do that. Members, any objection? Ms. Fogarty, Representative Bolso, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Fogarty, I'm concerned about Section Eight of this bill, and specifically. I've got two concerns. One has to do with our rules of procedure, and the second has to do with appellate practice. As you can see, uh, Section 8 is modifying 36-1-122B2, which currently 
provides a one-year period within which a party can seek to overturn an order of adoption. This section would reduce that time period from one year to six months and create an inconsistency with uh, Rule 60.02, which allows a party within 12 months to seek to set aside an order for mistake, surprise, inadvertence, excusable neglect, or fraud. And so the first question is, in your view, does Section 8 create an inconsistency with our rules of procedure? And then secondly, with regard to appellate practice, certainly adoptions are very typically expedited in the appellate system, but this uh, section would prohibit a court from overturning an adoption order uh, except within six months from the date of entry. And even under the best of circumstances, it's difficult to get a, an opinion from the Court of Appeals within six months. And so my second question would be, does this section create an issue with appellate practice? Thank you for that question. Uh, Ms. Fogarty? Michelle Fogarty, Legal Services. It is inconsistent with the rule in that it changes the statute of repose for adoptions to six months instead of 12 months. So in that regard, yes, it is inconsistent with Rule 60. Um, in regards to appellate practice, um, I would think the statute would take precedence over a rule, and so the person seeking to overturn the adoption would have to file with the Court of Appeals within six months, or they would be barred from uh, seeking to overturn the adoption. That's why we get the uh, thank you. Two, two points. One, if, if the Court of Appeals overturned an ad adoption order eight months after the entry of the order, in your view, is that opinion still valid, even though the statute says it has to be within six months? And then secondly, what is it that we should do about the inconsistency between Section 8 of this proposed legislation and Rule 60.02 of the Rules of Civil Procedure? Uh, Ms. Ford, you can, you can try to answer both of those. I don't know. The first question may be up to the, you know, the court's interpretation of our policy that we said. I don't know. You, you're more than welcome to, if you want to do that, answer that. That's fine. If not, I don't know if it's in your purview or not. But the, those, those, That would be up to the court to how to interpret it and resolve the conflict between the statute and the rule. That would be for the court to decide. Um, and in regards to the interpretation of the language in the statute, in no event shall an adoption be overturned by any court uh, or collaterally attacked after six months. Again, that would be how the court would interpret that as to whether or not it, uh, something was filed within six months or the court ruled within six months. That would be for the court to determine. Ms. Bolso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all my questions. Great. Fair enough. Leader Lambert. To legal, on that note, I mean, if this said trial court, would that resolve the, the circumstance we're talking about here? Because, I mean, any collateral attack, if a trial court has ruled within six months, I mean, obviously an appellate process is going to take longer than that. But it, is it fair to interpret that the, the wording of that really intends trial court? Or, or is that kind of, I mean, it says any court at this time. Uh, would it, I guess my question is, would it clarify that if it read trial court? Ms. Fogarty? I, I believe that would be more clear because it currently says any court. And so yeah. if you specified trial court, it, it could be worded to, so that it was clear that a, a challenge had to be filed with the trial court within six months. Okay. Any more questions for legal before we go back in session? Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and just back on the other point, I mean, I know the chairman of the Rules Commission who spoke just before me is very concerned about the fact that statute trumps rule, but is it fair enough that if a statute passes after a rule is in effect that the statute would be controlling? That's, yes, that's my understanding. Thank you. i just like to hear that out loud so that Gino can hear that as well. Thank you. Any more questions for legal? Seeing none. Without objection, we'll go back in session. Leader Lambert, do you have a do you have a motion or anything you want to propose? Hey, Mr. Chairman, I, I think my friend from Williamson County has identified a, a distinct issue in the statute. I mean, I I think the intent is trial court. That's really to the sponsor and to the committee. But I mean, I, I think anyways, the intent is that if somebody's going to challenge an, an adoption, that it be done within six months in a trial court. Um, 
Uh, I agree with Representative Bolso. I, I think for every single aspect of an appellate process to be done with this six months um, would be one of the fastest cases I had. I mean, it, it, that would be an extraordinary circumstance. Mm -hmm. So it's really more to the sponsor as to whether or not trial court is really what was intended there. If it is, um, Mr. Chairman, it's up to you as to whether or not an oral motion on just one word there would be appropriate. But I, I certainly would be fine offering that if both the sponsor of the legislation and the chairman are fine with an oral amendment on this. Okay. We, we have another week. So um, I, let's let's go ahead and just we'll, we'll just draft an amendment on that since we do have another week. I think it's been explained. I think really the only issue is just that. So it shouldn't take. Members want to roll this one week without objection. House Bill 551 uh, rolled next week's calendar. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. President Grills. I know I'm out of order here, but I want to recognize a couple of people. Back here in the back, uh, Mr. Steve Conley, he is the county attorney for Hobine County. And to his left, there's his son, Tripp. He's an intern up here. He walks around this halls all the time talking to different people. If you do not know the young man, I would suggest you have a conversation with him. He's extremely bright, uh, he's articulate, and he loves to talk. So uh, there's enough people up here that uh, appreciate somebody likes to talk to him. So go by and visit him, Tripp. And thank you all for coming by. From his mother, duly noted. And thank you for being here, both of y'all. Uh, members, that brings us to item 11. House Bill 552 by Charlie Littleton. And I've not seen any amendments once again. Thank you. My lucky day. That's right. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to go out of order just for a second and introduce Jennifer No, who is the attorney for Ashland City and Cheatham County. Welcome her here today, please. Thank and you. Chair Lady, if you don't if you don't mind, since uh, since you're here, we're here, and I see uh, Chairman Crawford walked in. Would you mind if we took him no, out of order and pulled fine. him from the hill to be heard? I, I insist. Members, uh, without objection, we're going to pull House Bill 1374 from the hill to be heard now. Very good. You got a motion. You got a second, sir. And I'm looking at uh, an amendment 4241. Is that something you want to put on the bill? All right. You got a motion and second, members. We'll, we, do we want to go ahead and adopt that amendment? Any objection? Looks like we do. All those in favor of House Amendment 4241 to be adopted on the, excuse me, House Amendment 4241 on House Bill 1374. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Say no. Ayes have it. And you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Uh, this bill was brought, brought to me um, from a citizen in my district that had an issue and uh, I have been working with the Tennessee Treasury to get this fixed. Uh, I'll be glad to go into the story if anybody needs more information. But if not, all this bill does is in, let um, me get the right TCA, TCA 29-1305. It goes in there and adds three components to this. Right now, if you have a relative that passes away and they're indigent or no one has the money to be able to take care of them, then um, the spouse, parent, grandparent, step-parent, child, grandfather, brother, sister, half-brother, half-sister, and spouse, parents, or step-parents, they can apply to the Treasury Department to be reimbursed for the funeral expenses. In my district, the problem was the uh, gentleman passed away and his caretaker was his cousin. And uh, so he applied to get this. There's nothing in there that addresses that. So it can't help my, my citizen in my district, but it may help someone in yours. This adds the words aunt, uncle, or cousin, or an individual re, 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 yeah, related to the victim by blood. This was the uh, the information that the Treasury gave me, and so that's what we're wanting to do is go in and change that and add the words aunt, uncle, cousin, or individual related by blood. And thank you for that explanation. Members, do you have any questions for Chairman Crawford before we vote? Any questions, comments? All right. Question has been called. Seeing no objection, looks like we're ready to vote. It's in House Bill 1374 as amended to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I just have it. Thank Move you, Mr. On. Chairman and committee. Thank you, sir. That brings us back 
two members. Item 11, uh, House Bill 552 by Chairlady Littleton, and I believe we left off with a motion and a second. You're, you're properly recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill puts into code that the goal of the Department of Children's Services must be to act in the best interest of the child at all times, and the goal must be reflected in any mission statement or motto established by the department. Thus, we expect DCS to insert best interest of the child language into their mission statement and other gov governing documents that reflect the purpose of the department. Very good. Thank you for that. Members, any questions or comments for Chair Lady Littleton? Before we vote, any objection to the vote, to the question? Seeing none. All those in favor, send House Bill 552 to calendar and roll. Say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I have it. Bill moves on. Thank you. Item 12 is rolled for one week. Item 13, House Bill 100 by Representative Stevens. You got a motion and second. And looking looking like you have an amendment, sir. 4466. That is correct. Very good, members. Second. We got a motion, got a second. We want to go ahead and adopt that amendment. Looks like we do. All those in favor of adopting House Amendment 4466 to House Bill 100, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Ayes have it. You're probably recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, whenever someone files a case in court, there is a litigation tax on there, and adoptions are no different. Uh, this bill, as amended, would allow the state portion of that tax to be removed to make the process a little bit less costly for those who wish to do adoptions. Uh, and with the amendment, it clarifies that it would not affect the local portion of tax. So uh, the bill just simply removes the state litigation tax from adoption cases. And thank you for that explanation. Members, do you have any questions or comments for Representative Stevens? Questions have been called. Any objection? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote. Send House Bill 100 as amended to finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Aye. Ayes have it. Bill moves on. And members, I believe that brings us down to the end of our regular calendar, unless I've missed something. And uh, we do have a, a special, what, excuse me, brings us to item 14 on the regular calendar. I do apologize. And that's House Bill 1355. Just just want to ask that uh, that we roll this, uh, roll this as a special calendar to be published with the final calendar. Any objection? Seeing none. All right. And I believe that's it. Anybody have anything before we go? Before we adjourn to next week? All right. Fair enough. We're adjourned next week.